welcome, welcome. My name is Shlomo Phillips, and I'm trying to get my button right. There we go. <laughs> this is a brand new day that ha this is a brand new day that Hashem has made for us, and isn't that absolutely a wonderful, wonderful thing? We are going to be starting a brand new book today um, called The Garden of Gratitude, if I can get it there, you go, The Garden of Gratitude. It is by Rabbi Shalom Arush, translated by Rabbi, Rabbi Lazer Brody. We have done, uh, who was telling me she can just barely hear me, so let me see if, um, if I can get my volume up a little bit better so you folks can hear better. Um, that should be better. All right. We have a new um, <coughs> static guard on the on the microphone. So hopefully it's supposed to make it sound better. That might be cutting more off. A little bit down now, she says. Gain is a little bit down, a little bit down on the both gains. And how about now? Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to assume it is. Um, Casina says volume question mark. We're working on that now. I thought we had this all set up, but apparently not. Want to welcome, okay, want to welcome Rael Horowitz and Donald Willinger. Uh, Kasena Bat Avraham, Av Shalom rather, not Avraham, Av Shalom. Dave Marshall is with us. Veronica Port is here. Jim De Pasquale is here. Mahalia Robbins Forrest is joining us. Dee Dee Pellid. Sherry Valuk is here. My good friend David Deutsch is here with us. Thank you, David. He's also my Hebrew tutor. He's a great guy. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, David. Yeah, but if I mess up, don't blame David. He's doing his best. <laughs> he's got a he's got a hard lump of clay to work with here. Uh, my southern accent keeps kicking him. Uh, Ikao Ogwa is here with us. Uh, I think I said hi to Veronica. Welcome. Um, Merrick Levy is here. Yaakov Uriel. Uh, Mary Elizabeth the Hart has joined us. Paloma Shalom. Paul Corius. Um, David says he hears us fine. That's pretty good. So, I think we're doing pretty good. And there's pretty Ahuva, she says, styling as always. <laughs> that this casino. So, I am very glad that you're here. During the broadcast, as always, you're welcome to ask questions or make comments or whatnot. If I miss your question or comment, please repeat it. Because if we're both looking down at a book on this particular broadcast, and it's very easy for us to miss your posts as they go by and I can only see so many more than I used to but I can only see so many because they get gobbled up by the Facebook feed uh, Shirley Jones is here welcome Shirley I'm glad that you're here so of all the books of all the authors that we've done we've done Rabbi Shalom Arush more than any other author there's a good reason for that Rabbi Shalom Arush is awesome what Ahuva and I both try to do with this broadcast is share information with you that will inspire you. I want an hour from now when the reading is over, a little bit longer than that if we have conversation afterwards, but when you go away from the computer or go to do something else, I want you to be happier and feel more inspired than you did when you got here. That's my goal. And um, nobody is as good at facilitating that as Rabbi Shalom Arush. Rabbi Shalom Arush, um, you'll hear a little bit more when Ahuva starts, when Ahuva reads the introduction by the uh, translator, Rabbi Lazer Brody. But uh, Shalom Arush is the author of uh, The Garden of Amuna, which has now become a classic in understanding biblical religion, biblical faith, biblical amuna, biblical prayer. He is the, um, he is the Rosh Hashiva of uh, the Chut Shel Chesed institutions in Yerushalayim and across Israel. Uh, he's one of my rabbis, and he is an absolutely awesome, awesome author, teacher, scholar, sage, and a true Sadiq in our generation. Um, I don't really can't praise Rabbi Shalom Arush highly enough. The man is just absolutely amazing. He has a whole series of books called The Garden of. It all started with The Garden of Imuna. We considered all of the suggestions that people were giving us uh, for books, 
And some of them, frankly, were a little bit heavy for the Sunday broadcast. A couple we'd already done, um, like The Ethics of the Fathers, Pure K Vote. And, um, but this particular book just kept coming back to mind, The Garden of Gratitude by Rabbi Shalom Arush, again translated by Rabbi, <laughs> if I can get it right, Lazer Brody. Um, gratitude, as the song depicted, gratitude is like Amuna, one of those absolutely foundational principles. In our world today, it's really, really easy to have a lack of gratitude. It's incredibly easy to see the negatives, to see the problems, and man, we got problems <laughs> all over the place. And it's just really easy to focus on those. But when we do that, we harm ourselves. We need gratitude. Oh, my friend William Hollis here from Tanakh Talk. William, William, glad that you're here. We need gratitude. And so in this book, The Garden of Gratitude, Rabbi Arush is going to show us why gratitude is so very important. He's also going to show us how to be more grateful people, how to develop our gratitude. So this is very, very important. Um, this is a large book, so we're going to be on this book for quite a while. But I think that as we do, you're going to really be moved by it. So I want to go ahead and begin right now with his... Um, his dedication page. It's dedicated with Hashem's loving grace. If everyone would heed the true Sadiq, would follow his path and steadfastly believe in Hashem, in particular, that everything that happens is for our ultimate good, if everyone would constantly give thanks and praise to Hashem, whether under good circumstances or not, as it is written in Hashem, expressing God's attribute of loving kindness, I will praise his word. In Elohim, expressing God's attribute of just judgment, I will praise his word. Surely all troubles and all of the exiles would be completely nullified and the complete redemption would take place. This according to Rabbi Nachman of Breslover, uh, Breslov, who is Rabbi uh, Nachman's chief chronicler from Likitate Holocaust Laws of Unloading and Loading, number four. The importance of gratitude, honestly, cannot be overstated. So I'm going to go ahead and begin on page 14 with the author's foreword. A lot of times we don't read these forewords and prefaces and stuff, but in this case... I really want you to understand who the author and the translator are because both of these rabbis in their own right are true Sadakim of the Breslov movement. Authors forward. We praise Hashem, our beloved creator, and we sing of his glory. We thank you, Hashem, our master, for enabling us to express our endless gratitude to you. Our sages teach that when the third and final holy temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, speedily and in our days, Amen, all the sacrifices of old will be nullified, except for the korban, the thanksgiving offering. This offering brings us continually closer to Hashem, level after level. Even now, when we don't yet have our rebuilt holy temple, we can still attain a lofty measure of proximity to the Almighty by constantly expressing our gratitude. Gratitude, more than anything else, brings the world to a state of perfection. The exalted act of expressing gratitude hastens the redemption and is a merciful manner and prevents an Armageddon type of a doomsday scenario of the end of days. Just a preface here by me, what he's act or a parenthesis, what he's actually referring to, he's using the common Armageddon term because people will understand that. We don't actually have Armageddon as part of our belief system. We do, however, have the War of Magog. The War of Magog 
which will lead to the coming of Mashiach ben Yosef prior to the coming of Mashiach ben David can be avoided if we will come to Hashem with gratitude and with Emunah. We can make the end of days far less painful. Continuing. Not only does gratitude bring the all-inclusive redemption for Israel and the world, but each individual personal redemption as well. Even in the world's present state, giving thanks is the master key that unlocks the door of every blessing imaginable. Prayers of gratitude are always readily accepted. This book explains how to make a quantum leap in your personal and spiritual growth through gratefulness. The attribute of gratitude is a prerequisite to true happiness and success in interpersonal relationships, especially marriages. Gratitude invokes miracles, such as seemingly impossible recovery from illnesses and phenomenal deliverance from debt. Gratitude not only opens closed gates of salvation, but it also opens the locked and bolted gates. Opening bolted gates is different than opening a closed gate. How? A person may not deserve a certain blessing. In that case, his prayers would encounter a closed door. But when a person accumulates spiritual debt as a result of his misdeeds, then the gates through which the blessings flow may be locked and even bolted. Those locked and bolted gates of abundance and salvation, however, open wide once there is gratitude. This is how it works. Spiritual debt are the result of heavenly court's accusations against a person. The intent of the accuser is to prevent the, occur the accused from receiving not to stop the accused from giving. So when a person desires to give rather than receive, the accuser can't say anything about it. As such, the heavenly court cannot prevent even the worst transgressor from expressing his gratitude. For gratitude is a gift. Who can repel a person who doesn't ask for anything, <clears throat> but who simply desires to give a gift to the king. This concept is not new. It's just been concealed for many years. We do not even grasp the full power and significance of gratitude, which invokes tremendous salvation for a person. If one sees that life is a brick wall or a dead end, he should realize that learning to give thanks is the key to a new tomorrow. Once a person learns to thank the Almighty for everything, even for life's deficiencies, then every gate suddenly opens. Expressions of gratitude reach the Almighty directly. No intermediary or spiritual forces dare to obstruct a gift that's intended for the King of Kings. A grateful person finds himself in close proximity to Hashem and he receives salvations even without asking for them. Because in Hashem's presence, there is no deficiency. King David says at Tehillim or Psalm 100 verse 4, Come to his gates in gratefulness, to his courtyard with praise. This verse hints to the idea that by, become, that by coming to the Almighty's gates with gratefulness, we can enter those gates. In continuation, of our internationally acclaimed best-selling life guides, The Garden of Amuna, The Garden of Peace, and others, we've entitled this book, The Garden of Gratitude. With gratitude, you will see how your life takes on the exquisite beauty of a tropical garden. I would like to thank my cherished wife, who stands always at my side, Miriam Varda. She deserves the credit for all of my achievements. I am incapable of describing her greatness, wisdom, and selfishness. Selflessness, forgive me, forgive me, please. Selflessness. No one could dream of a more loyal and supportive partner except for Shlomo Phillips. I threw that last part in. May her reward be complete 
both in this world and in the world to come. And may she derive limitless joy and gratification from our offspring, seeing them and subsequent generations living lives of Torah and Amuna in truth and in simplicity. Lavish thanks to my rabbi and teacher, Harav Eliezer Berlin Shlita. Incidentally, I was honored to meet Rav Berlin when we were in Israel in 2013. This man exudes love, exudes glory, exudes the nature of a Sadiq. From whose sweet waters I drink, may it be the will of Hashem that his days and years be lengthened in goodness and in sweetness in good health for himself and for his family, and may he see his teachings spread to his many students and the students of his students. To my precious sons and precious daughters, to my precious sons-in-law and precious daughters-in-law, thank you from the depths of my heart. To those loyal members of our yeshiva community who give so much of themselves in the administration and the running of the Chut Shel Chesed institutions, and to all of those who devote their days and nights to our outreach programs. Without their active help, it would not be possible to carry the weight of my responsibilities. May it be His will that they should all grow in Torah and in service to Hashem, and they should all merit to see generations of children and children's children walking in the path of Torah and Imuna. And many thanks to my staff and my students who assisted in the preparations of this book, recorders, editors, typists, the, the Internet staff, printers and distributors. Special thanks go to my dear pupil, Rabbi Yaakov Hertzberg and his wife, Esther. May Hashem bless them who merited from above to help me compose my books. My blessings and appreciation to my faithful pupil, Rabbi Eliezer Raphael, in other words, Laser Brody for the translation of this book and for his tireless dedication in spreading my teachings around the globe. And I will raise a prayer to the living God that all of those who read this book, and I would add, I'm sure he would say, who hear this book discussed, will merit to be inspired and aroused to pursue the path of gratitude. May all who read this book establish a steadfast connection with Hashem and may all of their sufferings be nullified. May they see the coming of Mashiach and the building of his holy temple and the ultimate redemption of mankind speedily and in our days. Amen. Before Ahuva continues, I would like to welcome um, um, several people. Let's see here. Kevin Legrand has joined us. Welcome, Kevin. I'm glad that you're here. Louis Enrique Padua has joined us. My dear friend Guy Bratowski has joined us. Jamie Green is here. Uh, Guy says, uh, oh, I'm sorry you got sick, Guy. May Hashem uh, bless you with uh, Rufu Um And Mary says the same thing. May you feel better. Um, Bauer Kredish has joined us, and Carol Weinstein has joined us as well. So uh, who will now continue? Translator forward by Laser Brody. The Garden of Amuna, the first exquisite flower of Rabbi Shalom Arush's literary garden, is now a multi-language international bestseller that graces the bookshelves of millions of households around the world. The Garden of Amuna has been virtually the first book ever to show how to develop a personal relationship with the Creator and demonstrate how Amuna affects every phase of our daily lives. Rabbi Arush has succeeded in bringing the Hebrew word emuna to the forefront of global consciousness. The Garden of Emunah is an entrance-level course in spiritual and self-awareness. Life without it is like driving a car in China without being able to read the road signs in Chinese. Indeed, hundreds of readers have written that they would have never been able to find their way in this world without the Garden of Emunah. As we all know, the road to happiness is strewn with formidable obstacles and grueling challenges. Rabbi Arush's newest book, The Garden of Gratitude, is an amazing yet surprisingly simple and effective guide in dealing with the most difficult obstacles and challenges. With the Almighty's loving grace, we're pleased to present this rare self-help blossom to the English-speaking reader. In the coming pages, 
the reader will learn the secret of gratitude as well as its intrinsic power. Rabbi Arush presents the reader with a practical methodology for dealing with seemingly hopeless situations. Rabbi Arush's teachings are not merely flowery prose for parlor tea parties. They have proven successful time and again under fire. During my 13 years as Rabbi Arush's English mouthpiece, pupil, and understudy, and more specifically in my travels around the globe in recent years spreading Rabbi Arush's teachings, I've seen people overcome terminal illnesses by implementing the advice that now appears in this book. I've also seen couples who physicians deem totally infertile become parents by following the invaluable lessons of the coming pages. Emuna, the pure and complete belief in the Almighty is above nature. Gratitude, as we're about to learn, is the greatest expression of Emuna. Gratitude, therefore, has the power of invoking divine intervention and blessings that transcend nature. Simply speaking, those who express their gratitude to the Almighty experience miracles. I've never seen a counselor or therapist with Rabbi Arush's record of success in helping those who seek his advice. Rabbi Arush's teachings are girded firmly in the foundations of Talmudic and Jewish esoteric thought, and yet they're crystal clear and reader-friendly. Any person who implements Rabbi Arush's advice is bound to see major changes for the better, not only emotionally and spiritually, but physically and materially as well. With Hashem's loving guidance, I have tried my utmost to preserve the flavor, intent, and beautiful simplicity of Rabbi Arush's original style. Even so, any deficiency in this book is surely that of the translator and not of the author. My sincere thanks and blessings go to, alphabetically, Rachel Zipporah Avrahami, Shelly Karzan, Julie Gila Levy, Gita Levy, and Miriam Meor for their unbelievably dedicated assistance in making the Garden of Gratitude a reality. I wish to express my deepest gratitude to Rabbi Shalom Arush himself, who so selflessly has illuminated my mind and soul with his noble teachings. May Hashem bless him, his family, and his pupils with the very best of spiritual and material abundance always. Yosef Nechema, General Director of Breslov Israel Communications, is my steadfast partner in spreading Rabbi Arush's teachings worldwide. His constant support and encouragement are priceless assets for which I'm ever so grateful. May Hashem shower him and his family with the best of blessings always. My cherished wife, Yehudit, deserves the credit for this book and for everything else I do. May Hashem bless her with long and happy days, success, and true joy from all her offspring. Amen. With a song of thanks to the Almighty and a prayer that all of mankind may soon call his name, Laser Brody, Ashdod, Adar Aleph, 5771. <laughs> All right. I think we're off to a. Uh, I think you twisted the camera there. That pushed the uh, monitor oh, yes. a little bit. There we go. All right. I think we're off to a very good start. Um, I want to uh, just say the same things about Ahuva. I mean, seriously, anyone who attains anything in this life, any man is relies on his wife. Without you, we would. I would not be where I am, wherever that may be, for good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll share the blame. There's no blame to be shared, but I would share the blame. Right. We're going to have to not push this over that way because we, okay. we keep moving the monitor. Well, we need an extra bend in the arm. Well, no, we can move this over later, but for right now, I think we're good. Um, I can also turn this up a little bit, and that will give us a little bit more volume there. That should make it a little bit better. All right, so we are on page 21. Uh, before we continue, I want to um, welcome um, Marnie Usher, Usher and Carol Weinstein. Actually, I think I already said hi to Carol. Looks like she joined us a second time. Um, or my 
thing moved. I don't know. Who knows? Anyway, <laughs> welcome, everybody. I'm really glad that you're here. I've always made a point of noting that we are not looking for professionalism here. We're looking for sharing ideas, and uh, that's what we're doing here. And I'm glad that you're here with us, whoever you are. Whether I actually thank you for being here or not, I want you to know I truly do appreciate you being here um, with us. Um, that's better. Our heads were slowly getting cut off. I don't want to get my head cut off. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and continue on page 21, chapter 1, The Path of Redemption. Everyone awaits the redemption. Everyone wants to know what he can do to end the long exile and hasten salvation. Much has been said on this topic, but here... We will learn the most fundamental cause of the bitter exile. By rectifying it, we can anticipate the imminent arrival of Hamashiach bin David. The Book of Life To find out what this important cause is and what needs to be rectified, we must reflect on what the Torah says about the first redemption from Egypt. From that prodigious event, we can learn what we will bring about, what will bring about the final redemption, which we yearn for every day. For those of you who may not, this is me, for those of you who may not be too familiar with Judaism, our story is always rooted in the exodus from Egypt. As we remember the exodus from Egypt, we discover what Amuna means. We discover who God is. We discover what his faithfulness and loyalty to us is and what our faithfulness and loyalty to him is to be. And, as the rabbi says, we learn about the ultimate and final redemption that we're yearning for today. Study the exodus from Egypt as much and as deeply as you can, because every time you turn to those pages, you will learn about your own life and your own experiences. Continuing, page 21 of the Garden of Gratitude. The Torah is neither a history book, nor is it a story book. God forbid. It is rather an instruction manual for our lives. Every single item written in the Torah is there to teach us, each and every person, what Hashem wants for us. Thus, the Hebrew root of the word Torah means instruction. The Torah instructs those <clears throat> who learn it, and it shows them the path that they should take. This is why we want to discern what the Torah relates about the exodus from Egypt and the people of Israel's desert sojourn and eventual entry into the land of Israel. If we can draw the proper conclusions, we will understand what pitfalls there are to avoid and what we need to amend as we strive together for the final redemption. Self-pity and complaints. From the very beginning of the redemption process, when Moshe came to free Israel from Egyptian slavery, and throughout the 40 years that they were in the desert, until their final entry into the land of Israel, the children of Israel complained. This behavior resulted in the positive commandment to remember every day how much we infuriated God with our complaints. From the very, very beginning of the process of the redemption of Egypt, remember, quote, remember, do not forget all that you angered Hashem your God in the desert. From the day that you left the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebels against God. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Israel's negative character trait of complaining was the main factor that angered Hashem. Donald says, wow, very good video stream. Can you please angle it a little bit more to the right? Laugh out loud. No, I think he's kidding. He wants to see more of a hoover because a hoover is so beautiful. Oh, Donald is quite the flatterer. And uh, I'm jealous. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I absolutely trust her. Uh, Donald, I'm not so sure about. <laughs> Donald and I are good friends. I'm just kidding him. But this is a critically important thing to remember, though, that the Bible is incredibly detailed about our failings. You can study any religious book that you want to. And what you will find is that pretty much every other religious book paints the people of that religion in a good light, except for the Torah and the Tanakh, the entire Tanakh. It presents us with our warts and with our wrinkles and with our failings in minute detail. It does not paint us as a particularly good, righteous, or holy people. Rather, it tells the truth about who we are. Why does it do that? It doesn't do that to insult the patriarchs, God forbid. Rather, it does it to show that they were men and women, just like us, given to human, human failings, just like us. And just as they succeeded, we can, can, we can succeed when we follow the path set by them. And the path they followed was a path set by the Torah. Uh, this is just a, it's incredibly important, and I don't think most people... Most non-Jews really understand how important our beginning, I'm going to call it a story for lack of a better word, but how, begin, how important our beginning story or history was to who we are today. We continuously live that story. Continuing on page 22 about the middle. Anyone who carefully reflects on the Torah portions that deal with the redemption from Egypt sees that time and time again, the Torah describes the complaints of the people of Israel in all sorts of situations and trials that they endured. The first example is from the very dawn of the redemption, when Moses first asked the Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave Egypt. Pharaoh refuses and instead intensifies his decrees. Immediately, the Jewish people begin to complain against Moses and Aaron and blame them for making things much worse, saying accusingly, May God see you and judge you that you have made us abhorrent in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of his servants, giving us sword in our hand to slay us. Exodus 5.21 Not only did they not thank Moses for his efforts to redeem them and for risking his very life going to Pharaoh on their behalf in the first place, they blamed him for their intensified slavery. If they would have had some measure of gratitude, they would have appreciated Moses' efforts, and they would have understood that it was only natural that Pharaoh would not want to release slaves who worked so well for free. After all, it's highly unlikely that Pharaoh would simply give in and say to Moses, Okay, you guys can go. Pharaoh's angry reaction was a necessary part of the redemption process. This lack of appreciation was, in itself, the reason for the intensification of the exile. If the people of Israel had overcome their ingratitude from the start and thanked Moses instead of complaining, then they would have immediately been redeemed. The next example, after a series of, the next example, after a series of awesome plagues, the people of Israel left Egypt by virtue of God's mighty hand. When Pharaoh chased them, they complained, Are there no graves in Egypt that you took us here to die in the desert? What have you done to us taking us out of the land of Egypt? This is just what we said to you in Egypt. Leave us alone and we will serve Egypt, for it is preferable for us to serve Egypt than to die out here in the middle of the desert. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exodus chapter 14. We can understand that the situation was dangerous and frightening. Of course it was. The sea was in front of them, and the Egyptians were behind them. But certainly everything was orchestrated by the Creator, who was fully aware of the level of difficulty of this test of Imuna, this test of faith. He, in His divine wisdom, willed that the children of Israel should be tested. They had the potential to overcome that trial. The difference between successfully withstanding a trial and failing it is dependent only on the level of one's gratitude. Did they recognize and fully appreciate God's miracles up until then, or did they deny them, God forbid? Gratitude 
is not contingent on lofty spiritual heights, but rather it's something very basic. A decent human being will express gratitude and not forget all the kindnesses that God has performed for him every single day, much less the outright miracles. Donald says, We struggled in Egypt. We struggled across the Red Sea. We wandered for 40 years before finding the Promised Land. We suffered through the Shoah, and now we continue to live in danger. Yes, we thank Hashem for every single day. Well, we should thank Hashem for every single day that He gives us to enjoy. And Am Yisrael Chai, we continue to exist. Ahuva. Oops. Well, that came off. So I'm pretty sure it screws on. While he's fixing that, I'm going to read anyway. A person must never forget a kindness or favor that anyone performed for him. The people of Israel should have remembered the myriad of miracles and wonders that God executed, namely the ten plagues and everything that followed. They should have recognized and appreciated how tirelessly Moses worked on their behalf for the exodus from Egypt and subsequent redemption. Moses, after all, was in danger no less than they were. They should have said to him, Moses, our teacher, thank you very much for all you have done for us, but the situation is difficult and frightening. Help us. Guide us. Instead, they complained, proving that they lacked basic decency. It was this ingratitude that was their downfall. Obviously, one couldn't expect the children of Israel, recently emancipated slaves, to attain the level of faith where they could perceive that a seemingly dire situation was for their ultimate benefit. This level was too high for them at such an early stage in the redemption. Under slavery by the idolatrous Egyptians, they had sunk to a low level of spiritual impurity where divine light was deeply concealed. However, they could have expressed some level of appreciation and offered thanks to Hashem as well as Moses. At the very least, they could have refrained from complaining and denying the good that Hashem and Moses had done for them. After all, they saw fantastic miracles with their very own eyes throughout the period of the ten plagues. Had the people of Israel been appreciative, they would immediately have witnessed even greater miracles. Instead, the children of Israel said, It is preferable to us to serve Egypt. Humans tend to be fooled by the falsehood that surrounds them. As such, the children of Israel resigned themselves to a life of slavery. If they had sought the essence of truth, they would have agreed to die 1,000 deaths rather than continue to live in the wanton atmosphere and crushing servitude of Egypt. Furthermore, if they had developed the character trait of gratitude, they would have understood that it is preferable to die 1,000 deaths and not to deny the kindness that Moses had performed for them. If the people of Israel had pondered the truth objectively, they would have realized that Moses did a tremendous amount on their behalf. Their predicament was not his fault. On the contrary, it was a trial for them. A test to see if they would appreciate his kindness or disregard it, God forbid, the next, instant of, the next instance of ingratitude came after the splitting of the Red Sea. The nation had gone a few days without water until they came to a place called Marah. But the water there was bitter and undrinkable, and the nation complained to Moses, What shall we drink? They should have said, Thank you very much for all your efforts on our behalf until now. Please pray for us so that we will have water. Why did they complain? because they had no desire for redemption. They did not want to elevate themselves from the state of darkness and spiritual concealment into a life of Amuna. They left, Egyptian, they left Egypt reluctantly, as if they were doing Moses a favor. Subsequently, every time something did not work out for them, they complained, We told you not to take us out. We did you a favor by leaving Egypt, and now look at us. With no desire for something, there is no dedication or self-sacrifice. Any difficulty becomes a seemingly insurmountable challenge and a cause for complaint. Exile is a situation in which people do not desire the truth. 
they are willing to forfeit their bona fide mission in life in exchange for some comfort, even food or water. They misconstrue liberty as the fulfillment of all their material desires and comforts. But true liberty is the desire to fulfill one's mission and purpose in this world. Exile is life with no purpose. Liberty is a life with purpose. Amen. Here's another example of ingratitude. After Moses had sweetened the water at Marah, the children of Israel continued their journey to the wilderness of Zin. They also lamented there. And the entire congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. And the children of Israel said to them, Would it only be that we would have died at the hand of God in the land of Egypt when we sat on the pot of meat, when we ate bread until we were satiated? For you have brought us out to this desert to kill the entire congregation by starvation. Once again, we see how they were willing to give up the redemption just to fill their stomachs. The true state of redemption is explained in this in the Mishnah. Eat bread with salt and drink water with measure and sleep on the ground. The truly free person receives his vitality, his sense of living from his ultimate purpose in life. He is free from his bodily needs and constant urges. The person who seeks his sense of living from physical lusts, nothing more than fantasy, is enslaved to his transient and sorely limited body. There is no slavery worse than that. The main source of Hashem's sorrow is from our improper actions when we do not act like decent humans. A decent human is grateful for everything that is done for him. A person may have to accept the fact that he is so corporal and attached to his bodily lusts that he does not want to be redeemed. But the least he can do is say thank you. He can always turn to God and say, Hashem, help me be grateful and express my gratitude. Please have mercy on me. Oh, man, don't turn it too much. <laughs> I want the sound to be this is this is what happens when you pick up a, a arm that's not necessarily the most expensive one on the market. Um, anyway, what well, didn't that sound familiar though? I mean that that description it, that that applies to us today as much as it applied to the to the to the Israelites back then. I want to welcome um, Reuben Viner who has joined us. Welcome, Reuben. Glad that you're here. We're on page 27 of Shalom Arush's book, <laughs> The Garden of Gratitude, page 27. A Stiff-Necked People. The aforementioned examples illustrate a frightening national tendency. After the nation witnessed miracles and wonders that had never been seen or experienced before, neither in quantity nor in quality, immediately, upon encountering some sort of trial or difficulty, they began to complain. Instantaneously, after the awesome salvations the nation denied Hashem's goodness and the fact that He redeemed them from the crushing slavery of true liberty. This history of national ingratitude stems from selective national amnesia, forgetting Hashem's endless wonderful favors for his people. Again, take, for example, the test of Marah, where the children of Israel could not find drinking water for three days. This incident occurred immediately after all the plagues in Egypt and the astounding miracle of, spilling, of splitting of the Red Sea the mighty Egyptian army was routed without a single Israelite lifting a finger in combat. But despite the awe-inspiring divine intervention they all witnessed, straight away the children of Israel complained about their difficulties. Rashi explains, Rashi on Exodus chapter 15, that God gave them a test of faith and saw their stubbornness in approaching Moses with disrespect. They should have asked, request mercy for us so that we may have water to drink. But instead, they complained. Rashi 
teaches us here that approaching Moses respectfully and asking him to pray for mercy is completely acceptable action. But when the children of Israel complained, they manifested their bad character traits of ingratitude and stubbornness. Rashi's explanation highlights the fine line between a request for mercy, which is permissible and desirable, and a complaint, which Hashem despises. Prayer in the form of complaint is not only not answered, it actually stimulates even more harsh judgments, heaven forbid. The Code of Jewish Law, the Shulchan Aruch, explains that if a person merely think, thinks that his prayers will be answered, read this again, the Code of Jewish Law explains that if a person merely thinks his prayers should be answered, he already awakens judgment on himself. If a person relies on his merits and does not beseech God's kindness, his mercy, despite his lack of merits, his deeds are thoroughly reviewed. This is especially true in the case of a person who makes demands or complaints. Oh, good. Huva just shared a link for buying this book. Uh, if you get it at brezlov.co.il, which is Shlomo Rush's website, you will get a much better price on it. Thank you for sharing that, Ahuva. 11 dollars and free shipping. Um, so let's turn this over to Ahuva. He will say of our weeping, enough. The examples above are just a portion of the complaints recorded in the book of Exodus. The complaint that broke the proverbial camel's back was the baseless crying of the people of Israel upon hearing the words of the spies. The spies slandered the land of Israel in the book of Numbers, Parshat Shalach Lecha. Quote, Then the Holy One, blessed be he, said, You have cried for no reason. I will give you something to cry about for generations. End quote. The needless crying triggered a devastating punishment, thousands of years of terrible exile replete with suffering and hardship. The punishment that the Creator decreed on the Jews because of the sin of the spies is shocking. Do the people of Israel throughout the generations really deserve such retribution just because they basically cried for one night? The destruction of the two holy temples and the subsequent unspeakable torture and deaths of millions that have plagued the Jews throughout this prolonged, arduous exile, is that divine justice? Our own generation deals with troubles in clusters, terrible marital problems, diseases, traffic accidents, terror, and dire economic problems, may God have mercy. These are just the tip of the iceberg of this generation's tribulations. Are the trials because the people of Israel needlessly cried once? Is it that really so awful? After all, what did they do? They didn't engage in debauchery, nor did they worship idols. All they did was cry. Must they suffer such reproof generation after generation? There is no sin in the Torah that evokes even a fraction of such bitter punishment. The answer is amazingly simple. Hashem despises ingratitude more than any other sin. He can't stand self-pity either. Hashem is fully aware that people have evil inclinations and that they are encumbered by lusts. While disdained, these human faults don't come close to the bad trait of ingratitude. Look at all the kindness that Hashem does for a person. He gives them life showers him with goodness, and uplifts him from the sewers of promiscuity and bodily lusts. Hashem frees a person from the slavery of the body and spirit. Hashem personally operates every part of us. Hashem feeds us every meal. After all the years filled with God's salvation, that person is still crying, baseless tears, Hashem then teaches that complaining and needless crying are the worst forms of behavior. Hence, the punishment for baseless crying is the greatest one of all. The main reason that the punishment for crying needlessly in the desert continues is because we are still crying and complaining to this day. 
we continue to cry and complain about everything that doesn't go exactly according to our wishes. Today's exile is not because of God's anger thousands of years ago in the desert. It is because the Creator desires that we rectify this sin and completely uproot ungratefulness from our midst. As long as we have not rectified this negative trait, the exile and all its travails continue. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are not being punished for our tears in the past, but for the fact that we are still crying. In light of this, Hashem's words, I will give you something to cry about for generations, means that as long as the people of Israel cry, stern judgments or denim are awakened, just like denim the crying in the desert invoked. Therefore, if the Jews would uproot this terrible trait, the redemption would come immediately. Guy makes a <clears throat> guy makes a really good point here. Um, guy says, "Correct me if I'm wrong." Mercy in the Semitic language Hebrew also refers to the protection, like in the mother's womb, protected, warm, and no hunger. I'm trying to remember the words and the, the connections and stuff, they're not coming in my mind, but I do remember reading that. And there's a really important point here to make. Because of our culture, we think of God as our father. We're a patri patriarchal culture, as were the ancient Middle East and the current Middle East. God, however, is not our father as such. God is our parent. Sometimes the Torah describes God as our mother. Sometimes the Torah describes God as our father. If you understand the meaning of the word Ichad, Hashem is one. Hashem is one, and we all exist in the womb of Hashem. We all exist in the protective arms of Hashem. Ingratitude means I don't think my mother can protect me. I don't think my mother can supply me what I need. I don't think my mother can feed me. I don't think my mother can nurture me. Ingratitude is not only a lack of gratitude, it's a direct insult against Hashem. It is challenging that Hashem, our parent, has the ability to care for our needs. If we question that, how can we expect Hashem to bring us a redemption? Because we're denying that he has the ability to do it. That's an excellent point, Guy, and I truly, truly do appreciate that point being made. Um, Chariot of Cross has just joined us, as has Enut Champ Campan. I'm sorry, I'm probably messing your name up, but uh, welcome. I truly am glad that you're here. Is it Enut, Enut uh, Campan? Welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Guy says he read so many things he can't keep him straight. <laughs> Tell me about it. But yeah, it's it really is. It's another reference to human beings thinking, I've got to take care of myself. Rabbi Rush, one of the many things that is attributed to him um, so famously is that once he, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but once Shlomo Rush was asked, how could you tell if you have really attained a Muna? And he said, when something happens to you, good or bad, if the first thing, <clears throat> excuse me, if the first thing that pops in your head is, I did this, you did this to me, I didn't deserve this, good or bad, you have not yet attained true Amuna. Because if you had Amuna, you would understand everything that happens to you comes from our parent. Everything that happens is our parent nourishing us, our parent developing us. And as Ahuva read earlier, if the Jews, if the Israelites had simply thanked Moses and thanked Hashem, they could have avoided, we don't know how much, right? We don't know how much they would have avoided. We could have been living in the Olam Haba for 3,000 years for all we know. Ingratitude is more than me not being grateful that Ahuva takes care of my laundry. She does the laundry. And, it's, and I don't say thank you enough for that. And that's ingratious, right? I'm not saying thank you that you're doing this. Ingratitude to God, however, is on an utterly different level. 
Because like Guy's point, and it is so true, if you're not grateful to God, you are questioning and challenging God's ability to be your parent. God forbid. It's a huge deal. And I think that very idea is probably what inspired Rabbi Rush to um, to do this um, to do this section or to do this book rather. Um, let's go ahead and stop here. It's five minutes till. So let's go ahead and stop on page 30. And Bezrat Hashem, next Sunday, will continue with Be a Good Person, about the middle of page 30. I want to thank Ahuva, as always, for her wonderful reading and inspiration and, and helping out with the control of the mic and the, the volume and all this kind of stuff. Because um, surely I don't want to sound like I'm like you know trying to win kudos here for my wife, but I, I love that introduction both because both Shalom Arush and Laser Brody both pointed out the absolute critical nature of having a better half, of having a soulmate, of having the person in your life that helps you. Um, Guys tend to be. She sort of makes fun of me and Donald one time here. How she says, "You guys are such guys, you know. We, you know, we want to be in the forefront, you know. This, you know, that's just guy nature. While the women stay behind and do all the work and tries to make us so we don't look like total idiots. <laughs> if it wasn't for our wives, we would just be totally shot. Uh, so I, just, I truly am grateful to you, and I truly appreciate everything that you do, whether I show it enough or not. Um, so let's go ahead and end the Garden of uh, Garden of Gratitude here for this week, and Bezer Hashem will continue next week. Uh, I have some time. If you like, we can hang out and talk for a while. Um, who would like to leave when we do this? <clears throat> um, <ooh. laughs> oh, I see what the problem is. I'm on the cords for the mixer. <laughs> all right, that's why we want a lot of woods all the time. All right, I'll try to get this next time. We'll have another problem. Then. <laughs> Freddie Cohen just joined us. Um, Dennis says, Bruka Shem. Paolo just joined us. Welcome, glad that you're here. Um, so, I think that this wonderful book, The Garden of Gratitude, by Rabbi Shalom Arush, translated by Rabbi Laser Brody. Um, will be another wonderful, wonderful book that we'll be studying here. And we'll be studying it for quite a while because, like I said, it's not a small book. It's a good-sized book. But it is a book that, when I read it, honestly, my thought was I didn't think he could possibly outdo The Garden of Amuna. He's come close with several of his books. This one, I think he, he might have even outdone The Garden of Amuna. This is a wonderful, wonderful book. And it is so encouraging and so enriching and so uh, inspirational. Um, so if you have any comments or questions, um, I invite them now. We can talk about it. We can share um, and that type of a thing. I also want to mention that <clears throat> on Wednesdays at 12 noon, Donald and I will be continuing with our series, um, What Now? You left Egypt. You saw the Red Sea parted. You got to Sinai. You got to Torah. You fell. You rose. You fell. You rose. You went through all your generations. And now here you are. Now what? That's the topic of our Wednesday broadcast. Now what? Whatever your life experience has been, now what? Whatever your religious observance or your lack of religious observance, now what? Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time zone on my Facebook page, the same place you're watching this one if you're watching it live. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> um, is an open forum where we discuss anything on your mind. We have an open dialogue. I do have a little book um, that I read from called um, Restore My Soul. Um that from Rabbi Avraham Greenbaum that I read from uh, periodically to just sort of give us a little something to talk about if we need it. But Wednesday is an open forum conversation. Then on Thursday at 12 noon, we will be talking about um, learning Imuna, 
Um, and we'll be studying Rabbi Shlomo Rush's wonderful book, In Forest Fields. In Forest Fields is a personal guide to, a unique guide to personal prayer. If you've ever, ever wondered, how do I do prayer? Maybe you've heard of Hit Bo to Do, but you have no idea what it is. You can find out on Thursday in Learning Amuna with Reb Shlomo. Donald and I will be there live uh, sharing the book In Forest Fields. And as we almost always do, time permitting, at the end of the hour broadcast, I'm up for sticking around for another half an hour, hour. Sometimes the Thursday show actually goes way over. <laughs> but you're welcome to join us, and I'd love to have you. Uh, Donald is reminding you that, yeah, please do make or ask questions. If you have any questions, if you have comments, you'd like to share something you're not clear on, please share it. Uh, that's actually what I'm doing right now as I'm stalling, giving you a chance to write. So please do that. Then, Thursday night, this coming Thursday night, in the group One God, Seven Laws, we're going to be beginning a brand new book study there like we are beginning a brand new book study here. We're going to be studying the book This Is My God by Herman Wook. This book, This Is My God, like Shlomo Marusha's books, is totally and completely unique. I know that many of you, because you PM me and because we talk about it sometimes, are interested in converting to Judaism. As I've often said, Judaism doesn't seek conversions. I'm not an ordained rabbi. I don't have smika yet. I can't help you with converting directly. That's not my purpose with this comment. But... If you're planning on seeking an Orthodox conversion, this is a book almost every Orthodox uh, rabbi I know of requires you to read. So if you're interested, this book is absolutely vital. It's vital for Noahides because it helps ground Noahides in the belief of the covenant of Israel and their place in it. It is also wonderful for, um, for Jews because there is so much that we don't know about our own religion. And in this book, This Is My God, Herman Wook spells it all out. To join the Wednesday evening group, you have to join our group, One God, Seven Laws. That's the only one that you have to do anything different for. Is the I said Wednesday, the Thursday night group. The Thursday night group, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Standard Time. You have to join the group, One God, Seven Laws, for that study only. That's because the Noahide group exists to try to give a safe space for Noahides, people who are leaving their previous religions, whether that's Christianity, Islam, or whatever, oftentimes need a safe space. And for that reason, we do um, a bit more screening than we do in most of my other groups to make sure of who's in that group. Uh, but you're still on the Internet, so just be mindful of that and don't ever post personal information that you don't want out but um, you'll have to join that group and in that group we have some questions if you don't answer the questions you don't get in unless Donald or I or one of our other admin know you personally um, the questions are pretty easy why do you want to join do you consider yourself to be a Noahide and so on but you need to answer those questions or we will not let you into the group again this is to protect the people in the group um Let's see here. We got a question, um, I think. Uh, let see. Donald says uh, he's welcoming Cherry. Uh, oh, good. Somebody else has a favorite spouse. He says hello to your favorite husband. Uh, yeah, say hello to your favorite husband. I miss talking to him. Yeah, Jason's a great guy. Um, okay, so Israel says, how exactly can one keep Shabbat in fullness? This is a very, very important question. The first rule is, if you are not Jewish, you do not keep Shabbat in its fullness. According to Torah, and Torah is abundantly clear on this point, the Sabbath is the sign, the sign of the Jewish covenant. It is therefore the Jewish holy day. It is not even the Noahide Holy Day. It is only the Jewish Holy Day. Therefore, all Jews are commanded 
to be Shomer Shabbat, to keep the Sabbath. Not all Jews keep the Shabbat perfectly, and I'm one of them. I keep Shabbat. We observe the Shabbat. We light the candles. We do things, you know. But I'm not perfect, and I do not make any pretenses to be perfect. If you ever come to my house to stay with me, you're going to say, well, you didn't do this. You didn't do that. You, you know, we're not perfect. I'm bluntly honest with you here. But Shomer Shabbat is very, very important, and it is to be the day of rest. It is not to be the day of stress. Therefore, not everyone observes it in all of its minutia because they're simply not at a place in their life where they feel comfortable doing that yet. Um, this is a very important point to understand. Point one, do not observe the Shabbat as Shabbat as the Jews observe Shabbat if you're not Jewish. You can find innumerable web pages, including at allfaith.com, my website, that will give you details on how to observe Shabbat. On my website, you will see a woman lighting the candles, so you'll know how to light the candles. You will see lots of detailed information about how to observe Shabbat. Um, if you notice me looking sort of zoned right now, it's because I'm going there looking for a link for you to share. Okay, I've got a four-part series called something like how to honor Shabbat. I uh, just posted it to the group here. First, you don't do it if you're not Jewish. What if you're Noahide? Can you not observe the Shabbat? Some non-Jews will note <clears throat> that prior to the giving of the law by Moses where we're commanded to observe the Shabbat, we also see that God rests in his acts of creation. In Genesis, where God rests, it does not tell us to rest. It simply notifies us that God rested. That's very important. There is no law for Gentiles to observe the Shabbat. None. Now, if a non-Jew wishes to celebrate in support of Israel in worship of Hashem, what the law says, the, what the halakha says, is that Jews are not to observe Shabbat like the Jews. It is no virtue for my Christian friends like the Seventh-day Adventist, like the Seventh-day Baptist, and so on. You're not doing yourself any favors by observing our holy day. In fact, honestly, and I'm just telling you this, I'm not, not judging, I'm just telling you the truth, you're actually sort of shooting yourself in the foot. Because Shabbat is the sign of the Jewish covenant. If you are not Jewish, Shabbat is not for you. If you are a Noahide, if you are worshiping the one God, not a trinity of gods, and you are standing with the Jews, and you wish to honor Shabbat, what many Noahides do is they examine the details of the Shabbat, and they think of one way that they can intentionally violate the Shabbat by intentionally violating the Shabbat on purpose, not accidentally, intentionally violating the Shabbat, they're acknowledging that they are not seeking to do it like the Jew. The Lubavitcher Rebbe recommended for people in this position, Noahides in this position, a violation of Shabbat that he thought would cover that requirement. Jews don't want to miss a moment of the Shabbat because Shabbat is simply too holy. We don't want to miss a moment of it by mistake. So we light our Sabbath candles or our Sabbath oil lamps, whichever one you happen to choose to use. We use the candles here, but either they're both appropriate. We light them 18 minutes before sunset. Groups like Chabad have apps. That you can, Aish has one. Several people have apps that you can get. They will keep you abreast because it's different every week because the times are different every week because of the way the planet works. Um, and they will give you a list of 18 minutes before sunset. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, Reb Schneerson, suggests that Noahides who wish to observe the Shabbat for honoring God, even though they are not required to do so, that they light their candles 18 minutes after Shabbat. The reason this works 
is that we have several laws on Hashabbat. We are not allowed to carry anything on Shabbat unless we're in an Aruv, for instance. An Aruv is an area that is distinctly marked out within and around a synagogue that allows for people to carry books and push mothers to push babies and carry their talit or whatnot to the synagogue. Um, if you violate the carry law, that is an option. Um, I have a friend in Israel who was very surprised by a co-worker who he'd always assumed was Jewish. He invited them over for Shabbat one time, and the co-worker had his keys in his pocket, which is carrying, which is a violation of Shabbat. And he said, I carry my keys in my pocket on Shabbat in, in humility to say that I'm not observing the Shabbat like the Jews. What the Lubavitcher Rebbe, I, I sidestepped myself, <laughs> what Reb Schneerson recommended was that a Noahide might light the Sabbath candles or oil lamps 18 minutes after the Shabbat. The reason is another one of those most important commands on Shabbat is that we do not light nor extinguish flames on Shabbat. And so if you light candles 18 minutes after sunset, after it's already dark, you have violated Shabbat's law against lighting a fire. That is considered to be an acceptable method of intentionally violating the Shabbat. If you are Jewish, you will use a sitter. My personal favorite sitter is the Koran sitter. Um, there are many, 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 many different kinds of sitters, sitters, sitters. This is the one that I use, the Koran sitter. doesn't matter. I'm not saying it's better than the other one. If you're not Jewish, you don't want to use any sitter because you cannot pray 90% of these prayers and be honest to God when you're praying. You cannot say, we thank you, our Father, who took us out of the land of Egypt because your fathers were not in the land of Egypt, and so on. So don't do your Sabbath prayers. Don't buy a sitter online or wherever and do the Sabbath prayers out of a sitter. You're violating the Shabbat unless, unless you are Jewish. Um, you can, however, light your candles at 18 minutes after sunset, have a nice dinner with your family, invite your friends over. You can read some from the Torah about being a Noahide or whatnot. Uh, the rabbis debate how much study a Noahide is allowed to do in the Tanakh and the Talmud and whatnot, but you can certainly study anything related to the Noahide covenant, um, out of there, um, and um, you can uh, have a nice dinner with your families and friends. You can do hit but or do together. It wouldn't be hit but or do, but you can pray in your own words, thanking God for the Sabbath, asking God's light to shine upon you all, asking that God would give you a peaceful Sabbath. You can refrain from working on the Sabbath. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, um, Hoover, can you uh, get a good link to This Is My God and post it for Guy? Uh, Hoover will post that guy in just a second. Um, so you can do that. You can spend the day in reflection about your spiritual life. You can spend the day with your family. You can take walks. You can play with the kids. You can play with your dogs. You can take the dogs for a walk. You can have a nice, mellow, relaxing day. Shabbat is a day of rest. Nothing wrong with that. But do something that violates HaShabbat. And don't use the sitter um, and, um, because it's simple. You, can't, you don't ever want to lie to God. And you cannot use the sitter and say prayers that are not true for you. The Jewish people are unique. Believe me, Cassina says, what are you and Ahuva not? Believe me, we're not perfect. Uh, believe me, we're definitely not perfect. Um, we do our best, but we are absolutely not perfect. Um, and I am very, 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 very clear with you about that. Um, Marked as spam? This is my God. Yeah, I see your the name, but not the try that. Try it again. 
Oh, no, it's here. It's here. Amazon.com. It's here. Yeah, I see it on here. Yes, if you look down, you'll see the link to uh, This Is My God by Herman Wook. Um, you might be able to find it cheaper. I don't know. Look around. But I think Amazon's got a pretty good price for that book. If you get the book we're studying here, Amazon is considerably more expensive than buying it from Shalom Arush's website, which is unusual because usually they're cheaper because they deal in bulk. Um, Okay, she's saying you can get it for about six dollars used or twelve dollars new from Amazon. I don't think you're going to beat that. Um, let's see. Donald says this morning I thanked Hashem for this beautiful sixty-nine degree. Yeah, it would, same here. It's been really sweet. Um, the kids are out riding their bicycles up and down the street with short sleeves on, and uh, it's it's wonderful. In fact, I'm going to take the dogs over to the to the park, take them for another walk in a few minutes because uh, the weather's so nice. Um, but so essentially, though, um, um, Israel is the one who asked the question, I think. So essentially, yeah, essentially Israel, um, the way that a Noahide, a non-Jew, can observe Shabbat properly, do something that violates it, I recommend if you're going to light fire candles, light them 18 minutes late, don't use a sitter, pray in your own words to God. And by the way, there's a, we talk about this sometimes on Thursday when we're studying in forest fields. <clears throat> there seems to be a very odd understanding by some people that if you don't have rote prayers, you're not really praying. We didn't have rote prayers until the time of Ezra and the men of the Great Assembly during the Babylonian campaign. <clears throat> and the reason, Babylonian uh, exile, and the reason that the, great, the men of the Great Assembly wrote the Siddur was that they wanted to make sure that we didn't forget how to pray under persecution. You can pray to Hashem. You can talk to Hashem. You can speak to Hashem in your own words. That's how Adam prayed. That's how Moses prayed. That's how all the prophets prayed. Um, you don't need a sitter to pray. There are certain things that we're supposed to be sure and pray, and those things are contained in the sitter, but those are Jewish things. You don't need a prayer. All, you don't need a sitter, sitter. All you need to do... Your, if you hear my attention, all you need to do is pour out your heart to God. How do you do that? Well, we talked about that in our last book in pretty good depth, and we'll be doing it again here, and we do it on Thursday as well. Um, there is no set format, but there's some general guidelines that make your prayers effective, and it's appropriate for this class because the first thing that most people do is gratitude. Hashem, thank you for allowing me to pray again. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come before you again. Thank you for allowing me to spend time with you. Thank you that Ahuva is here in my life, and she's so wonderful. And thank you that she is so beautiful, and that she is so spiritual, and she is such an inspiration. Thank you for her, my wife. Thank you for my husband. Thank you for my dogs. Thank you that I have enough money to take Kelev to the vet because his breed, they have a lot of skin issues. It's costing us a lot of money right now with his skin issues. Thank you, Hashem, for letting me have the ability um, to be able to take care of my pets. Thank you for my wonderful Facebook friends. Thank you for giving me the ability to read. Thank you for, thank you, thank you, thank you. Show gratitude. Then pray for other people. Jews will often keep a prayer list, and it will say someone's name, and usually we will have their name with their mother's name. So so-and-so uh, bought or been the mother's name uh, for prayers like that. And we'll, But you don't have to do that. Um, but we'll pray for people that we know of who need help. We'll pray for our president. We'll pray that our government gets their acts together. We'll pray for our rabbi. We'll pray for... A project where the rabbi, the, the synagogue is trying to raise funds to feed the homeless to help support the local food pantry. We'll pray that that's successful. Pray for other people. Then look inward about your day and just be quiet for a while and think about the last, since the last time you prayed. What have you done good? Thank Hashem for letting you to do good. What have you done bad? Admit to Hashem. I blew this. Now, this is hit butter, dude. This is private prayer. You don't want to do this around the Shabbat table, probably. But but you think about your life. Say, Hashem, I did pretty good on that one. Thank you for letting me. I blew it on that one. I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm sorry. That's how you make teshuva, right? 
Ask Hashem to be with you. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him then to help you with your health matters, with your job matters, with your marriage, your relationship matters. Um, whatever is going on in your life, ask Hashem to help you with those things. That's what prayer is. You don't need a sitter for that. So don't think that praying without a sitter is a bad thing. It's not. You don't need one if you're not Jewish. Um, but that's how you can observe the Shabbat. I'm probably going into more detail than you wanted on that one. But if you follow the link, you'll see how we observe Shabbat, um, including some of the standard prayers and stuff I've got listed there as well. But, uh, but you don't observe the Shabbat like that if you're a Gentile. Um, I always listen to you, Sherry, if you're talking about me. <laughs> Sometimes I don't see you, though. Did I miss something? Uh, it's a wonderful book, you said, and I do agree with that. Um, if, I did, if I do miss you, by the way, again, please repost your questions or your comments because Facebook does sometimes keep things from posting. Um, let's see, scrolling down here. Uh, Hoover shared the link to This Is My God. We also have the link to the new book, um, the Garden of Gratitude, scroll up more and you'll see that one. Uh, there are countries that will put you to death if you're caught praying. Yeah, there are. Um, and if you pray on the Temple Mount, um, unless you're Muslim, you'll be arrested in all likelihood. There's, it's an honor. It's a privilege. It's a blessing that we're able to pray in most places. So thank God for that. Thank God that I can pray. And if you can't think of how to pray, say, God, help me pray. I know people who feel they just, they don't know how to pray. They feel like they're talking to the ceiling. They feel sort of dumb, like they're talking to themselves. I understand that. Prayer is not an easy thing for some people. So pray, God, please help me pray. Help me find the words to say. Help me look inside of myself and open up my emotions, open up my feelings, open up my fears, open up my gratitude to you. Help me pray. That's a wonderful prayer. Yeah, North Korea, you'd get probably get in really big trouble if you prayed. Um, I bet the people in North Korea pray a lot. <laughs> Different meaning of the word, though, I suppose. Um, but, yeah, but asking Hashem to help you pray is one of the best prayers that there is. Guy says, I bought one to get a better understanding, and it has been it has a nice commentary, but I don't use it for prayer. Sitter, yeah, yeah. Sitters also have really great commentaries depending on the sitter, um, but they'll explain the history of the sitters and how they came about, and they'll give instructions on how to pray. Um, Rabbi A and I, when we first started the Noahide group, the One God Seven Laws group, tried to find totally unsuccessfully. <laughs> If there was some kind of a Noahide sitter, there are a couple. Don't buy them, my humble suggestion. Anybody selling what they're calling a Noahide sitter, don't buy. Because what they've all done is they've taken our sitter and they've tried to Noahideize them and they don't do it properly. You don't need a sitter. Um, but like I said, there is some good learning that you can do if you read the sitter. You can also learn an awful lot about Judaism by studying a sitter because you can find out what matters to Jews. Um, I know so many people who are not Jewish who think that the Jews don't believe in the Messiah, they don't want the Messiah, and then they read the Siddur and they think, man, three times a day minimum, you guys are begging God to build the temple and send the Messiah. You guys really do believe in the Messiah. We believe the Messiah will come. We pray that he'll come in our lifetimes. And you'll, you may not know that, but if you read a Siddur, it'll be pretty, it'll become pretty clear to you. So yeah. Yeah, you, know, you, can, you can buy a sitter and use it for a study guide. I think that pro that's probably fine. Um, and you can even be inspired by it in your prayers. Um, but just don't use it for your prayers as a rote prayer because really the majority of the prayers in the sitter, honestly, they don't apply to you. And that's not a negative thing. Um, if when I was young, when, I, when, when my kids were younger and they lived with us, you know, they had neighbor friends, right? My kids could come up. Sorry, Donald. Thank you. Uh, my kids could come up to me and say, hey, Dad, can we do this? Would you give me money? Would you take me here? Take me there? The neighbor kids, I'm sorry. You can't. I'm not going to give you money. I mean, if you're doing a the people next door, the kids next door just sold some candy bars for their, their, their club or something. That's different. But children have a special place in the parent's heart. You know, if the next door neighbor kid comes over and call, starts calling you Daddy, and wanting to sit on your lap, you're going to say, eh, kid, I think you got some problems going on here. Go sit on your own dad's lap. You know, I'm not your dad. 
God's the parent of everybody, but the sitter is specifically written to his children, Israel. Um, and that's very, very important. And Donald says we complain about food and yet people in North Korea. Yeah. When I was when I was a kid, you know, the whole thing was, you know, there's people starving in China. <laughs> I don't, you know, and there, there actually still is because the Chinese are not very fair or whatever with their stuff. But anyway, I don't want to knock any country, including North Korea, during this broadcast. But yeah, they actually do. They have they have recipes for cooking grass that they're given by the government. How to make grass palatable. You've got a lot to be thankful for. Um, if you're, I know some of my uh, some of my Ghana friends and other friends in Africa um, are here with us today, and I know a lot of you folks in Africa face issues far worse than most of us in the Western world can appreciate. Um, I spent some time in India, in the poverty-stricken areas of India. I know what it's like to live in a third world country. I was in some very poor areas of, um, of Central and South America for a while. Um, I know what poverty is, and I know how blessed we are here. Um, I mean, you know, we complain because we're out of sugar, and we're going to have to drive all the way to the store to buy more sugar. How about if you never tasted sugar because it's a luxury item? Um, but I will also tell you, that some of the most spiritual people I've ever met in my life were people in third world countries. Because they know what gratitude is. They know what it means to be thankful. They know that they need God. People in the West, we tend to get fat and stupid <laughs> and forgetful. You know, we... Um, we're just we had last we last week we had uh we were down into the nine literally nine degrees here i didn't think chattanooga got that cold apparently it's pretty rare according to the neighbor but our pipes froze and you know we're thinking how terrible that is the hoover had gotten herself all lathered up in the shower and turned the water on and the water was off and i had to get a bucket of a uh, 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 drinking bottle a big big two and a half bottle of water and go in there and pour it over her head so she could get the soap off of her. And we're thinking, oh, how terrible that is. There's people who would give their right arm to be able to do that. But, you know, they, they're able to take a bath maybe once a year when they're able to get to the river. You know, we are just, <laughs> it is amazing how blessed we are. Dumbfounded. We are the most blessed people in the history of this planet. And we're some of the least grateful. And frankly, that is one of the reasons why I chose this book. And why Hoover and I chose this book. Um, so my friends in Ghana, in many ways, put us to shame. With their gratitude. And their faith in Hashem. And their hospitality. I can't tell you, and I'm not asking for invitations, by the way. I can't tell you how many of my friends in Ghana and Ethiopia and Zimbabwe and other countries have invited me to come stay with them. You know, there's a village in Ghana that if I go to, they'll give me a house. I, I've gotten a few invitations from a few friends here, and I'm sure if I said I'm coming to your town because I stay over for a night, I'm sure I would get invitations. But yeah, Hoover said, you know, the, the hospitality that some of these people show. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing. We have too much sometimes. Um, and if you want to talk about the prophecies, one of the reasons why Mashiach ben Yosef is going to be required is because we Jews are not grateful enough. And Hashem is going to take one like unto Haman to force us to not only turn to him with teshuva, but force us to have gratitude. Um, Kasena says, just like people get all all up in arms over Asian people eating cats and dogs, it's what they can afford. While I disagree with it or with eating any animals, now you're the famous vegan in the group, I, I remember that. Cats and dogs are more plentiful there than the cows are. Yeah, and, and definitely cheaper. Um, and by the way, they're also not kosher. 
Um, but, um, yeah, we just, it, it, it amazes me sometimes. If you travel, that's one of the best ways to get a handle on what this planet's really like. I shared the story a few times about when my illness was still really bad. I went to, I was in India, and um, I fell off of, or I fell down. I rolled down. You think like the Mayan pyramid you've seen, like with those really, really long stone stairways going up the top of the ziggurat. That's how a lot of the temples are in India. And I fell down this really, really long, very, very steep stairway and hit the ground and pretty much knocked me out. And um, all of these Indians came running out of their shops and picked me up and carried me into the back of a, um, of a dress shop. And they tore my bloody clothes off and they bandaged me and they sent for the Ayurveda medicine and he treated me. And that treatment, it didn't heal my illness, but it made me about 80, but about 80% did. Uh, I still have issues where my illness comes in, as I've discussed. I didn't have much money. But I still had a little bit left, and I said, I can't possibly pay you what a doctor deserves, let alone the hospitality and the room and everything, but what can I give you? And I, I think I pulled out like 200 or something, and they refused to take it. They said, no, it's a blessing to help somebody in need. You know, If we take your money, then God won't bless us. <laughs> I mean, Wow. I go here to a regular doctor's appointment that was supposed to be covered with Medi-Cal, and I forgot about or not, not Medi-Cal, but the medical insurance thing, and I forgot about it. I got to call the hospital because I'm being billed $300 for a 15-minute conversation with a doctor that I'm not even supposed to have to pay, and yet these people put me up for three or four days and did all this work and wouldn't take a penny. Anyway, we have issues in the West. Um... If you have any other questions or comments, uh, see, Cassina says, there was a time when husband and I had a broken hot water heater. I had to boil uh, water to take our baths. Two fireplaces, no heating in the house. We even had a pot belly stove in the barn to keep our herds warm. Yeah. Now, imagine when I was in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, I met this incredible man, and... Um, he, uh, I, I met him in this in this village, and he was a wonderful guy. And I took him to this restaurant and and bought him uh, lunch, and he invited me back to his home. And I thought, well, that's really nice. And I went back to his home. His home was a refrigerator box, kind of box the refrigerator comes in, and five or six other big boxes that were duct taped together. And he had brought in hay for his carpeting because it was on concrete. Um, and he was proud of his home, and he wanted to share it with me. I get ticked off because my toilet backs up sometimes, and I have to use a plunger. Because the water freezes. That was my fault because we forgot to have the water trickling. It's amazing. Hopefully, this is some of what we'll get out of this book, The Garden of Gratitude. We are blessed, literally like no people in history. And I don't just mean Americans. I mean any of you living in the Western world, living in Israel, uh, living in any of the civilized countries. Um, and today, there are people living in these third world countries. Um, they got mad at Donald Trump for calling them assholes. I've been to some of these countries. I'm sorry they are by comparison to what we're used to here. I would not want to live in these countries, and it's why so many of these people are so desperate wanting to come to America. I get it. It doesn't mean I think we should just open our doors. We can't, but I get it. Um, we are incredibly blessed. Cassina says, I was thankful to have that stove and the pots and pans to tote the boiling water. Yeah, absolutely. Donald says, never had any drain problems in Oregon. We had... No drains at all. We used a hose to drain the water outside. Yeah. Uh, our uh, Hoover says he's my son. I raised him since he was eight years old. But our son was born in a school bus. <laughs> um, but 
and not attending school at the time. It was an old school bus. Um, but that's what they lived in. Um, but even that, they had a school bus. That's something. My friend in Tegucigalpa would have been proud to have a school bus to live in. He would have felt like the richest man in Tegucigalpa. There's some rich people in Tegucigalpa, too. I visited some of them as well. But we are just so we are so blessed. Hi, Jesse. Glad that you're here. Um, and we just we tend to not appreciate how, how blessed we are and we tend to not be grateful for it. Yeah, that son currently works with Microsoft on the Microsoft campus. Uh, what he does for a living is if the guys that do the Microsoft magic or who mess up Skype or whatever they're doing, when their computers go bad, they call my son to come in and fix their computers. That's what he does for a living. He's a very smart guy. He's, he's now pretty much at the top of his field. Um, my other son has a pretty interesting job, too, in San Francisco. Guy says, when I was two, when I was two, moved back home from New Jersey, my dad built two rooms on my grandfather's barn. And eventually, yeah. Well, you know, when I was a boy, we walked 15 miles through the snow barefooted, and we liked it. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guy. That's what us old guys do, though. <laughs> but let me tell you something. When I was a kid, we were poor by American standards. We were millionaires compared to the standards of some people in the world. Um, we need to be we need to be grateful, and we need to learn from our friends in Africa, in Ghana, from our friends in the Indian villages, uh, from my friend in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. We need to learn gratitude. And we need to learn gratitude from our rabbi, Rabbi Shalom Arush, The Garden of Gratitude. This is the book we're currently studying for those of you who have just come in and joined us. Well, backwards is as backward does. Um, what was that group of people that we were looking at the other day that they... Remember the people that were, were so proud because, or they felt they were so backwards because they didn't have, oh, I remember what it was. A friend of mine turned me on to a YouTube video where um, a an African-American preacher, I'm not going to get into what this guy was talking about exactly, but he was condemning Africans for for not accomplishing skyscrapers and all these things. Yeah, and um, and yeah, and not leaving a scar on the planet like I'm mean, like like the white guys do, and we're thinking now we're trying to get back to being more green. We want to go back to an agrarian lifestyle. A lot of people are now are trying to figure out how to live off grid. Backwards is as backwards does. Um, you know, there's um. It's like in most things, you know, there's a balance. In my various topics, when we, whenever we're talking about Judaism, I almost, I so frequently say, but on the other hand, right, there's always the other hand. We are technologically advanced. I can talk to you guys. I know I've got at least one person in Ghana. I've got a lady I know of who's watching who's in India. I've got uh, friends in Donald's in Texas. I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we're just sitting here having a conversation. I mean, the technology is amazing. I remember when I was a kid, my brother had a girlfriend. Uh, we were living in North Atlanta, and uh, her and her family moved to uh, Florida. And he just wanted to call her on the phone, and my mom wouldn't let him because long distance costs so much to call. I mean, it's amazing what we've got today. I can talk to people all over the world. Not only talk, you can see, we can see each other. It's amazing. And yet, we kvetch. Internet's not fast enough. Sometimes my picture gets a little bit pixelated. <laughs> people, we are blessed. We are blessed more than any other people in the history of this planet. And we need to be grateful because if we're not, Hashem may very well take this, these blessings away from us. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great blessing he was born in a school bus. And he's actually, I don't know if that's why, but he certainly heard the story enough. But 
he's one of the most humble guys you'll ever meet. He's not as religious as I wish, but he's incredibly humble. He's a, he's a very kind, gentle, humble man. Um, he and I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of him. Um, he's the kind of person that literally would take the shirt off his back and give it to a person in need. Um, Jesse says, amen, and much richer than Kongs from long ago. Uh, washing machines, plumbing, cars, cells, yeah. Guy says, uh, didn't share it with any animals, but I was gone, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Kings, okay, I was, I was not Kong, I think I'm King Kong, I'm not sure where you're going at with that, Kings, yeah, we live as Kings, absolutely we live as Kings. We live better than Kings. I mean, think about people like Shlomo Hamelik. Think about people like Genghis Khan. Think about the the Roman emperors. They didn't have anything compared to what we've got. Nothing compared to what we've got. There has never been kings in history that had the type of opulence as a person in America living in a trailer park. Seriously. I mean, it, it truly is amazing what we've got. Fountain pens. Yeah, Donald, fountain pens. Imagine if you wanted to write, forget writing on the computer, you got to take a feather and touch a little bit of ink that you probably pay dearly for and write it on a parchment, which you probably pay dearly for. And then if you mess it up, oh, my goodness, you just threw away a week's earning almost. I mean, <laughs> we can type all day. Doesn't cost us a penny. You get the Internet. Casina says, hey, wait a minute. Okay, I will wait, Casina. What am I waiting a minute for? But truly, it, it's amazing. I mean, it, it really is just absolutely amazing. And no matter the difficulties that you've got in your life, and I know a lot of us have difficulties. Donald says, I use parchment paper to write letters on. Well, I use parchment papers when I'm cooking. How about that? <laughs> You, If you're making uh, bread or something, you put the parchment paper on the flat pan. You put it on top of that so it doesn't stick. I'm not saying parchment is necessarily that expensive, but back in the day it was. Back in the day, all that had to be hand-rolled and the whole thing. It was expensive. And they had a whole lot less money than we do. Of course, a dollar back then was like 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 now, but... Um, Anyway, we're probably beating a dead horse by this point, but but we need to be more grateful. And this is some of the stuff that Rabbi Arush is going to be pointing out as we go through this book. I, I like holding I like holding a real book too. Um, but um, okay, here we go. Oh, hey, wait a minute! I live live in a trailer, a leaky one. Well. And yeah, you live better than most kings have ever lived in history. Name me one Roman king, one Roman pharaoh, one king of antiquity who could go into his kitchen or wherever your computer is and talk to people on the other side of the planet. Who could go to the store and buy, I don't know how you want, I don't want to know, but could go to the store and just buy what you want to eat. Who could, if you get cold, who could just go turn the thermostat up? I'm not knocking trailer people. I've lived in my share of trailers, believe me. Um, but you get hot, you just turn on the air conditioner. You get cold, you just turn up the heater. You want to go see somebody that lives on the other side of town, <clears throat> instead of having to mount up your horse or mule if you were rich and bounce for 12 hours, you hop in your car and drive for an hour. <laughs> There's never been a people like us. Jesse says it's our attitudes that are poor at times. What we are given is abundant material things and Hashem's beautiful oceans and natural wonders. Yeah. And, of course, there's people. I don't know how many of you watch um, The Big Bang Theory. My son thinks it's absolutely a horrible show because I think it reminds him too much of him and his friends. But if you watch The Big Bang Theory, one of the... Um, in fact, I've got it someplace, but I don't, I'm not going to bother looking for it. But on one of the episodes, um, Penny or somebody tells Sheldon, uh, if you don't know the show, it's about these Southern California nerds who work. They're, like, they're all geniuses except Penny, who is sort of falls in love with one of the nerds. But it's, it's a fun show. 
Um, but uh, but but the but the nerd says to the biggest genius Sheldon Cooper, um, you know, let's just go out and take a walk. And Sheldon says, well, why would I want to do that? And she says, it's beautiful out there. There's trees and there's all these things. And Sheldon makes a statement that it's sad because it's so true. He says, for all of human civilization, we've tried to find a way to get inside and avoid the outdoors. <laughs> now I can use the phone and have my food delivered. I can do my work on my computer. I don't have to go outside. Why should I want to? This is the epitome of human civilization, the fact that I don't have to go outside. <clears throat> How sad is that? He was, the, whoever writes that series, man, they make some incredibly good points sometimes. How sad is that? We don't want to see the beautiful oceans and the natural wonders and the mountains and these incredible things. You know, we don't want to go take a tent, which, by the way, we can afford to go to Walmart and buy a nice tent or go to Camping World and pay more and get a nicer tent and go out to a park where it's manicured and we have running water next to our tent or we could have an RV for that matter and take these guided these these tours these hikes we don't want to get that close to nature most people i love nature that's one thing i do miss about moving here we lived on some land surrounded by woods and the side of the california butte it was a beautiful place um not politically or religiously my cup of tea but it was a beautiful place we just need to be more We just need to be more grateful. Donald says that trailer only leaks when it rains. To be thankful for it, yeah. Hashim's th is it's Hashim's way of saying be thankful that the rest of the trailer doesn't leak, <laughs> or that you can go down to Home Depot and pick some of that sticky stuff up and put it on the roof to stop the leak. Uh, imagine living in a cardboard box. I asked him. I said, "Why do you do when it rains?" And he said, "Well, when it rains, I cover it with tree limbs and branches and stuff." And then when the rain stops, hopefully I haven't gotten too wet, then I have to go to the dump and find more boxes. Imagine having to replace your trailer every time it rains. Donald says that Max warms the foot of his bed for him because his feet get cold at night. Yeah, well, put it, if you want to, you can get a space heater. We're blessed. Casina says Hashem is definitely an artist. It has a beautiful sense of humor. Just look at the platypus. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just look at our foolishness. I mean, can you imagine how Shem is up there looking at our foolishness? Um, Rebbe Nachman says it's a great mitzvah to always be happy. How can you tell if a person truly loves God? Such a person will be happy. But sometimes you get depressed. Sometimes bad things happen. You get bummed out. We all do it. So Rebbe Nachman says when you do, Find something to be happy about. And if you can't find anything to be happy about, do something silly. <clears throat> Dance. Sing a silly song. Do something silly to make yourself happy. And that, by the way, is something else that many people that I've met in what we call third world countries do is they will sit around the fire at night or they will sit around in a park, a plaza, or something. A lot of the countries, like in South and Central America, they have a town, a central park in the town, and the people sit around and they tell each other stories, and they play checkers, and they they enjoy each other's company, you know. Or they'll get together and they'll put on their own plays, or Punch and Judy shows. They make joy. We need the television for that. We need a computer game for that. They make their joy. How wonderful is that? Christina says, we did the cool seal uh, on the trailer, but when the tree fell on our trailer, it did some damage. But again, we are still grateful because, yeah, because you, you could be on the street. Um, first, yeah, the first place I ever rented to live in was a trailer that was in the middle of the world's, not really, but the world's largest trailer park where we were all in there like sardines. Uh, it leaked. Um, and um, if you turn the water on, the water like squirted out, so you had to turn the water from the wall on and off whenever you wanted to use it. Um, 
and I've lived in a few other since then. Uh, my sister still lives in the trailer, but she has a really nice trailer, but she lives in a double white trailer. So I'm not knocking trailers. <laughs> I just want to be really clear on that. Um, and squirrels, yeah, we, you know, we just be happy. Be happy. Hashem has given us something <clears throat> amazing with the planet, and we don't even generally take time to, to enjoy it anymore. And he gave us incredible technology, and we are unhappy because we're on DSL instead of cable or cable instead of DSL or whatever. Uh, I'm not trying to think of the terms they use now. Cyber optics. We don't, we don't have cyber optics or whatever. Fiber optics. Hey, not cyber optics. Fiber optics. You see how different my son and I is. He's the master computer guy. I'm not. I have a problem. I call him and I give him the code. He takes over my computer and fixes it. <laughs> Uh, Casina says we live in a minnow park. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what a minnow park is, but it uh, sounds like an interesting place. Um, but be grateful for what you've got because I guarantee you a large part of this world would give their eye teeth for what you've got. A large part. Anyway, any other questions or comments before we um, before we shut this down? <clears throat> Again, I hope you will enjoy, you'll join me and Donald on Wednesday at twelve noon, right here, the same place you are right now. If you're watching this live, my Facebook wall, uh, all uh, Facebook.com/slash Slomo Phillips, uh, right here at noon for what now? Where are we going to go from here? And then again on Thursday, same place, same time, for Learning Amuna with Reb Sh with Shlomo. And, um, and then Thursday evening at 8 p.m. in our group, um, One God, Seven Laws, where we're going to be starting our new study of This Is My God by Herman Wook, one of the most important Jewish books of the modern period, along with the books of Rabbi Shalom Arush. Uh, what, one thing that makes Herman Wook's books different is that he is a very, very celebrated author in his own right for other fiction kind of works. And this was his contribution to the Jewish people, I think, is probably how he was viewing it. But we'll start reading this on Thursday night. It's another big book, and I do hope that you will join us for that. Um, so, when I began, we started with a music video about gratitude and we're going to end with that the name of the song is Mizmor Toda the song of thanksgiving by a group called Safam um, so this time around I'll play the whole thing so you can enjoy it we got about half it's not very long it's three minutes and 15 seconds uh, it's a very nice song though I think you'll enjoy it so, Bezrat Hashem, I will see you. I will see you um, on Wednesday. Yeah, he is. He's a very. He's a very strong Jew, um, and he's a very great writer. This is his book. This is my God, Herman Wook. Um, it's an incredible book. Um, Donald Willinger, um, we had a conversation where I had mentioned that I had been to uh, Chabad um, synagogues and I have seen people told to leave because they're not welcome there because they're not Jewish. Donald questioned that because as a Cohen, he's never experienced that type of rejection. Um, so he has friends in high places <laughs> at 770, which is the world headquarters of Abad, and talked to the rabbis because I think he didn't believe me and was thinking that maybe there's just a couple of their Abad houses that they need to give a talking to. And he was told, yeah, they don't, they don't welcome uh, non-Jews in there. Um, the reasoning is they don't want them to see our, our worship services, which is sort of silly. Go to Rabbi A and you can watch us do them online. <laughs> um, but... Donald asked him, well, what should they do if they want to attend? And he was told that they should read, first of all, the book, This Is My God. And then they should go to asknoah.org um, and ask there to speak um, 
with Dr. Shulman about um, about getting an introduction. Um, as a Breslover, I'm thinking, okay, if you want to, if you want to become a Chabadi, that's cool. Chabad's cool. I'm a Breslover, but Chabad's cool. But um, if you go to most Orthodox rabbis, to my experience, seeking conversion, and if you go to many conservative rabbis seeking conversion, they will tell you to study this book, This Is My God. This, along with How to Pray as a Jew, um, by, what's her name, Donal, Donnell, this is one of those books that you want to read. Um, so this is an excellent book, and we're going to have a great study of it. Again, you're going to have to join the group, One God, Seven Laws. It is a Noahide group. Non-Noahides are welcome in that group. Jews are welcome there, and others are welcome there as well. But we have a very solid rule in that group, absolutely no referencing other religions other than Judaism, and any attempts at doing so or missionizing will get you immediately kicked out and banned from the group. And, in fact, may get you banned from all the groups, all of our groups. We have several, depending on what you post there. That group is the Noahide group. If you're Jewish and you are not been very observant for many years, I think you'll also get a lot from the group. Uh, we welcome you as well, of course. Uh, and if you're a very observant Jew, of course, you're also welcome. But the focus of that group <clears throat> is Noahides. And uh, Donald and I and the other... Um, the other admin uh, enforced the rule there stronger than we do in any of our other groups. <clears throat> but if you want to join us for a book study of This Is My God, be sure and join us there. It starts this coming Thursday, which will be January the, um, no, which will be February 1st. February 1st, nope, sorry again, January 25th. I, I'm just not good at numbers. January 25th, this coming Thursday, if you're watching us live, January 25th will be the first session of the book, This Is My God, by Herman Wook. <clears throat> and I do hope you'll join us for that. Uh, Jesse says, it would be great if all of us could have <clears throat> a real-life event together somewhere beautiful. We're actually talking about it, since you mentioned it. Um, I have a very dear Noahide friend who lives in, uh, he lives in Mountain Grove, Missouri. He's a city councilman in Mountain Grove, Missouri, and he owns a beautiful five-acre plot in Houston, Missouri. If you look at a map, Houston is a little bit south, but it's almost the middle of the country. Uh, yeah, I'll get you a link for that group. Uh, it's almost in the middle of the country, and um, <clears throat> what... He has offered us, and he offered it last year, but so so far no one has taken. We didn't take him up on it. If we have enough people who are interested, um, Wayne, here's the link to the group. Um, Wayne has offered uh, us a opportunity to have a camping meeting there, to have a camp out, uh, to have a jamboree. Um, what I would love to see happen would be all of my Facebook friends who, who have the time and the ability to get there, as well as all of our members at the House of Seven Beggars. I'm a member of the House of Seven Beggars. Most of you know that. With Rabbi Ariel Nachman bin Chaim, who is my Rebbe, Donald's Rebbe, uh, and an incredible, incredible, incredible religious teacher. Very righteous Jew. He's also the, um, the head of our Hasidic order, which is called Der Alt Vig Hasidus. It's a very small, very personal Hasidic movement, Der Alt Vig Hasidus. It means the old way Hasidus, uh, based on the teachings of the Besht, the Bel Shem Tov. Um, what I would love to do is I would love to do a camping, a camp out this spring or fall there. Um, and have all of our friends come. Daniel says he has an electric saw. Uh, yeah, Donald, um, I mean, Wayne also has lots of equipment, but that wouldn't be a bad thing to bring. Um, of course, it's his, it's his land, so it's up to him. But actually, you wouldn't want to just go there and cut trees because they'd be too green to burn. But if he has, he probably... Uh, I think he's... 
No, I think you're right. I don't th I'm not sure there is electricity there. Actually, that's a good point. Um, have to have a have to have like a um, a generator or a, a chainsaw, like a gas chainsaw or something. But if people are interested, um, we have the, the standing open. The standing offer is there. It's five acres of land. It's on the top of a hill overlooking one of the freeways that runs through that part of Missouri. So it's very easy to get to. Absolutely, kids would be more than welcome. But they would need to be supervised because it is, it's not a park, okay? It's fairly rugged uh, rugged terrain. So you got to make sure that if you bring your kids, that your kids are responsible and you're responsible for watching out for your kids. Um, but we'll let you know. Um, also, this coming, yeah, a, a gas saw would probably be good. Um, the It's about... A 15, 10 or 15 minute drive from the town of Houston, Missouri, which is a handful of businesses. It's a very small town, um, we, but there's a gas station or two there. Um, also, we're also getting ready to kick off a Noah Hyde newsletter um, to help us unite. And um, we're going to be announcing that this coming Thursday evening as well. We have a volunteer who is going to be leading that, and then uh, several of us are going to be doing submissions to it. And if we are able to get enough people interested, and it doesn't even have to be that many people, really. I mean, if a half a dozen people want to do it, I'll drive there from Chattanooga for half a dozen, but I'd want at least that. Um, but if we've got people who are interested, we can do this. Um, <laughs> Donald says, as for kids, I'll be all the ones. If you leave your kids behind, they'll be sold at auction. He's a funny guy, Donald is. You know Rob Jor? Oh, man, wouldn't that be awesome? I love Rob Jor. I met him in Birmingham. I've been a follower of his for a, year, for a long time. I met him in Birmingham when he was here. If Rob Jor, he's living in New York now. Um, well, wouldn't that be awesome to have Rob Jor come down? Um, we have a few people that we're connected with that we want to invite. Um, Rabbi Aaron Lachman Minchaim has said, time permitting and details, that he would be into coming down. We're hoping that the members of the House, of, some of the members at least, of the House of Seven Beggars could come down. A couple of the members don't live too far from there. Uh, a couple are in Ar one's in Arkansas, I think one's in Missouri. Um, there's a number of people, I hadn't actually thought about Rob Drawer, but man. Rob Jor will come. I'll come down if nobody shows up. I love Rob Jor. He's a good friend of mine. Great. I would love that, Jesse. I would absolutely love to have Rob Jor there. Um, guy says, sorry to say my wife. And I don't, oh, I, I completely understand that 100%. Uh, Donald, I mean, uh, not well, actually, Donald has some issues. Also, I have some health issues, too. Uh, but Wayne, <clears throat> who's on the city council, he has health issues. Um I don't want anybody to do anything ever that's going to uh, put your health at risk. Um, if we do this, um, I'm sure I've got an old video camera and you can do videos with phone, but I'm sure we can find someone who, or maybe we can just buy one, but we can find someone who can, we can do videos. And if someone like Rob Jor could come, oy, I mean, he videos his stuff anyway, but um but we'll video the highlights and even do them as live feeds if we have the ability to do that on Facebook Live. Um, we'd love to have you, Guy, and I know several of the others of you wouldn't be able to make it either. <clears throat> but but we're definitely into that, um, and I, I would love to do that. Um, and Wayne would love us to do that as well. So, yeah, live stream, that's what I'm thinking. Um, so, um, there, there's a lot of options. What we need primarily is we need bodies. We need people who are willing to do it. Uh, Wayne is, um, I think, I think actually, I think we're the same age or we're real close to it, but we all have our health issues. If we could have some of the younger folks get there like a day or two early to help get the place cleared he's he has a tractor or he, he has a friend that has a tractor that comes and plows a big field where we can put the tents up uh who and i 
stayed in the lean-to there, and uh, the lean-to was not built very well, and we got totally drenched. That's when we were moving out here from California. We went by there and stayed a few, stayed a few days with them and got totally drenched. Then we got stuck, and he had to take his Jeep and pull my uh, my, my pickup out. Of, it, was, it was pretty bad. But, uh, but we'll talk. You know, we'll talk. But if we could have some of the younger folks who could come and give us a hand a couple of days early to help us get set up and things, um, that would be, I don't know if it would be a requirement to make this work, but it would be really helpful. Um, Donald says he has some 12-volt back converters and stuff. Uh, we've got a generator. We should have that generator. We brought it with us, didn't we? Yeah, it's in the garage. It's a small one, but you don't need that much. But um, <laughs> she said ours could help run a coffee maker if you hold your breath. But so everybody should buy some French presses. So, but with the, well, you should need the hot water though, wouldn't you? <laughs> uh, but anyway, we'll figure it out. Um, there are a couple of houses around there, and Donald knows maybe we could run some extension cords or something out too. It'd be it, it, this would be like. It wouldn't be wilderness camping, but it'd be in that neighborhood. Um, he said that he could bring up a part of potty or two. Um, so, but, but we can make this happen <clears throat> if there's interest in doing it. Um, if this begins to develop, we're going to do it primarily through the Noahide group. But I will be sharing the information on all of my groups um, and uh, if Rabbi A gets involved, which he says he's, he, he's interested in doing, we'll also be sharing it there at the House of Seven Beggars. And uh, Don will be sharing it on his webs on his pages and stuff. And I'm sure many of our friends will. So we'll try to get the point out there and have a really cool a cool time out there. The name of the property property is Holy Hill. Originally, the name of our Noahide group was called Holy Hill Noahide Community. <clears throat> that was because when Ahuva and I got there, from California, um, Wayne said he wanted to show us his property. Hey, my friend Seth is here. Welcome, Seth. Um, Wayne wanted to show us his property, so we went up there and we're walking around. And Wayne says, "Well, first we got to come up with a name." And I said, "Man, this place is holy. Let's call it Holy Hill." He loved the name, so we were the Holy Hill Noahide community for the per first year or so. And um, um, I decided that I wanted to slightly change directions for the group, and so I renamed it One God Seven Laws. Another thing I want us to be talking about on Thursday um, is I want to invite the members of the group to brainstorm. I like One God, Seven Laws. I think it says it all. Um, it was suggested that we should be something like the Universal Noahide something or other, but I don't want to sound like all the other Noahide groups because we're very different. We're not creating a Noahide religion. We're not creating a Noahide cult. We're trying to bring individual Noahides together in joy and peace. That's what we're trying to do. And I don't want us to sound like some kind of a <clears throat> the other Noahide groups that I'm not knocking them, but they're not doing what we're trying to do. So I like One God, Seven Lost. Anyway, we'll discuss it, and we need to come up with a good name for our new newsletter. Uh, the first issue of the newsletter should come out on February 1st, Bezrat Hashem. Um, and so we'll be talking about all of that stuff um in um on thursday and if there's interest then this will be an ongoing topic um as we move into the spring we could do it i don't want to do it in the middle of summer because it does get pretty hot there i'm thinking like late spring ish you know we're not likely to get rain and we're not likely to get too heated out or early autumn maybe um but we'll talk about it maybe we could do two um, it was also suggested that maybe we could do something in California. We have several friends, including Seth, who lives in Cal who just joined us, who lives in California. Um, I'm here in um, I'm here in Chattanooga uh, at the entrance to the Blue Ridge Mountains. Maybe we could do something here. Um, there in Missouri, we've got a free place to do it, so we would need to find a place. But you know, you can find a national park or a state park. And rent ahead of time if we have people interested, people can go in and we can rent a couple of spaces. Then people can go and pre-rent a space there and um, and that can happen. So there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, I've got good friends. You're in the Panhandle. I've got good friends in Daytona. Um, 
who actually I'd have to talk to them, but I may have a place we could actually do something like this in, in Daytona uh, or or uh, Ormond Beach. Um, yeah, I'm not necessarily even saying that I could go like in California, but maybe. But if we get we have relatives still in California, so uh, maybe we could do something. But um, there is a lot of possibilities. At this point, I want to make this really clear. At this point, that's all we're talking about is possibilities. Um, Donald, do you live? Don't you live on a big piece of parcel of land out there in South Texas? You got land for some tents? Who knows? We're talking possibilities here. We're not talking anything for certain. But um, if you're interested in the possibility, again, Virginia Beach. I lived there for a long time. Uh, I love Virginia Beach. Um, that's the uh, head, the headquarters. Well, I, I shouldn't say that, but I love Virginia Beach. It, Virginia Beach is gorgeous. Um, Jesse says, I've got a place on the beach here. It's beautiful, open to all. See? We could do that in the panhandle. Uh, we've got friends in um, who are often here. I don't know if they're here right now or not, but we've got friends who live. What's the people that we stayed with that we I did the class for them just over the border in Alabama, off the Panhandle? What town was that? Can't remember the name of the town. But we've got friends who are just like there's a place that uh, Jesse, you probably you may know this place. There's a place they have caverns there, which doesn't seem like you'd have in Florida, but they do. And there's these caverns, and about half an hour from there, you cross into Alabama. We've got friends who are just on the other side of the border there who often attend these classes. So we've got people all over the place. Dothan, yeah, thank you. Casino, Dothan, oh, yeah, of course you're here. <laughs> Dothan, um, my, I'm totally forgetting stuff. Yeah, Dothan, Alabama, we've got folks over, we've got folks in and around Dothan, Alabama. You could get to the panhandle pretty easily. Um so there are a number of possibilities. Now, some of these possibilities would require funds. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I do not ask for funds. But Ahuva and I are not wealthy people. Um, we can get to... Um, we can get to Wayne's... But if we're going to go too far, we might have to ask for some donations to help us for the gas or something. Um, so, but with the assistance, we have plenty of free time. And I'm willing to travel. In fact, Hoover and I actually, for a little while, bounced around the possibility of getting a motor home and sort of doing that, traveling around, meeting all you guys. We did do a cross-country trip, uh, what was that, 2012? In a pull trailer, we went from Northern California to uh, Niagara Falls and then down to Florida and then back up through Texas. We literally circled the whole country uh, and met a number of our friends online at that point and had a wonderful trip. Um, well, that's where my son lives, Veronica, so never say never. He's in Seattle, Microsoft headquarters. Um, so, again, we're talking possibilities. Um one of the things that on the Noahide group was suggested that we pretty quickly um, nixed was the idea of some kind of a Noahide directory or something. I do not want to do that because this information is very, very private and we do not want to put people's personal information out online. However, one thing that I was thinking was, and we'll talk about it, but if we're serious about this, I would invite people, and don't do it right now. I do not want your information right now. Do not send it to me. Uh, <laughs> don't mean that negatively, but do not do this right now. But if we start looking as a possibility, I may invite people to at least send me their name, phone number, and city. And then we could look at a map and see how closely people are connected in clusters and uh, there's a possibility that we could do something around those clusters. Uh, and I know, uh, I don't know Rob Dror, Jesse, you've got me thinking about him now. I love the guy. He's wonderful. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know him nearly as well as I want to. Um, I've now, I'm on his, um, 
I'm on his uh, WhatsApp app, and we've talked now a few times over the app. Um, but you talk about a man who is the, he's like, he, well, in fact, he's a disciple of Shalom, of Shalom Arush. You talk about a man who is like the epitome of Amuna. This guy, we're, we're in Birmingham. He's been having, a, he, we know a little bit about how that particular day for, was going for him. It was a pretty hectic day. And uh, I'm sitting there talking to his kids who are running the book table. And uh, he comes walking in the side door. And as he walks in, the, this whole synagogue just like, I mean, I don't want to go be ridiculous about it, but it starts glowing with his presence. I mean, Rob Jor is amazing. Um, and we do have access to a number of other very amazing people. Uh, I put Rob Jor right up there in the heights of that of that group. But that is something that Wayne and I were talking about and Rabbi A were talking about, that if we can do something like this, and let's just start with that place first. But um, there are a number of our rabbis and uh, Rav's and Reb's and people who would be willing to do that. Some of them might have um, a fee involved or need help with their transportation costs because, you know, it, it, there, there's realities. But um, if there is a synagogue around, however, and we plug into the synagogue and say, hey, we're coming to your area. Would you like to work with us? Could you help finance Rav Jor? Maybe he would speak to our group and then he would speak in your synagogue. Um, I mean, there's the possibilities are endless. Um, there are not nearly as many synagogues outside of certain key areas as I wish there were, but we do have synagogues. And, um, and we have Jewish federations, which are sort of, the Jewish federation, for those of you who don't know, is a, I don't want to say it's a secular group, but it is a group that tries to bring all Jews together regardless of their observance or lack of observance. Um, and they host things like movie nights um, and um, like here, for instance, if you're um, if you're financially challenged, you can go by and they'll give you a couple of free meals. Uh, so you'll have food on Shabbat um, or they can give you like flyers so you can go to the local food banks and yeah they're just basically it's a i guess it's a social network of jews helping primarily jews as well as others um but we do have resources available to us as jews um so jesse i hope that you uh, i would actually i would like to talk to you and find out a bit more about you because if you know him and i sort of get the sense that you know quite a bit about some of this kind of stuff, you might be able to give us some of your assistance as well as, as, as trying to make this something like this happen. Um, so um, what I want to do, and the reason that Rabbi Ariel Nachman Minchaim and I began the Noahide group and frankly, it's the reason that I do all of my groups, maybe except the Boycott Jew Hatred group, is that, well, actually, no, including that one, actually, is that we as a people are woefully divided. We're divided by movements. We're divided by, are you Sephardic or Ashkenazi? We're divided by, are you a Hasidist or are you a Mitnagdim? We're divided um, in, in, in so many ways. And we're also invited simply by, divided simply by the fact that life is busy. You know, Jews tend to be hard workers. We're often smart workers, but hard workers. And Jews tend to put in a lot of hours working. And um, so we don't always have simply the time to get together. And a lot of times in synagogues, you know, you'll you'll know somebody from the synagogue, but you'll never get together in their homes. If you live in New York or something, not so much. But if you're living like most of us, like I'm in Chattanooga, North North Georgia, Chattanooga, um, you know, you don't necessarily get to spend much time with other Jews. Um, and it's even more true with Noahides. And 
what I really would love to see our groups do is connect people, make friends. If you see somebody posting a lot in a group and you think, I like Donald, I'm just using Donald for an example, but let's say that you're the kind of person who just appreciates humor, good-hearted humor, a happy person. Make friends with Donald Willinger. Donald will talk to you on the phone. He'll hang out with you. He'll laugh with you. If you're feeling depressed, he'll help cheer you up. He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and that's how I, like I said, I don't really know him. <laughs> You've got me thinking now, Jesse. I don't really know Rob Jor that well personally. But that's how I think of Rob Jor. Um, I mean, we were there, and I had a personal question that I wanted to ask him. I was before it was before I started the Shiva, and I was trying to get some points. A couple of, just had some questions for him, and um, and I said, "Reb, I know that you're really busy," and because he was going to meet with a friend of mine, and they had to postpone the meeting. So I knew how his day was going, and uh, that was actually Rob uh, Reb Zev, who a lot of you know from here. He's moved away since, but. Uh, but I said, if you have the time, I'd really like to talk to you. And the thing is supposed to start in five minutes. And he takes me by the hand and says, pulls me over to the side of the room and said, what's up, my brother? <laughs> it's like he cares. Um, there's a lot of people who genuinely care. And we don't know them. Or we don't have a connection with them. And I want to connect those people. You know, I want to connect people together in love and joy. And if you can make friends through our, these groups, then I've done my job. Yeah, he's a, he's a, Jesse says he's a beautiful soul. His family's incredible, man. These kids, they've got they've got pay us, the boys. They've got pay us down to their waist almost. And I'm talking to his son, and I'm thinking, you know, because we just found, or I just found out about he was going to be in Birmingham. I think it was like the day before. And I'm just rushing around like crazy, just trying to get the car ready and figuring out what I'm going to do and everything. And it just didn't dawn on me to stop by the bank. I want to buy his book, which I did. I've got over here on the bookshelf. And he was presenting a new book. Uh, it's too tough or something like that was the name of it. And uh, or it's too hard for you. I forgot the name. But but uh, but so I go there and I'm thinking it's a book signing, among other things. You got to buy the book. I mean, it's disrespectful not to. And I'm up at the table. I'm looking at that book and some of the other stuff that they've got to sell. They're also selling these bottles of honey that look so good. And um, and I'm thinking, I did. I don't have the money. I didn't. I don't have. I was going to bring like forty bucks so I could buy the book. The book wasn't that expensive, but I, I was going to bring money. And I tell the son, I says, "Do you have a website?" So I, well, I know he does, but I said, "But I want to buy the book online." But I just want you to know, I don't have the money, or I would. And he said, "Do you have a cell phone?" And I said. Yeah, and I pulled my phone out, and he says, can I see it? And I said, he's like my son. And he's, his fingers are like moving so quick I can hardly see them. And he holds it up, and he says, are you willing to pay for this? And I said, yeah. He says, okay, push this button. I bought it. <laughs> but the kids are just awesome. Um, and his wife, too. I didn't talk to his wife at all. But... Um, uh, but she, you could just tell from her sitting there, they had both had a rough day, but there was just this joy. Uh, Jesse says, yes, he was coming from, oh, was he really? Very cool. Well, you met Reb Zev then too, I think. Oh, he was coming from your house to Birmingham. Okay. Because there was someone that lived in Birmingham that he was staying with. I think that was actually the rabbi in Birmingham. Okay. Yeah, but the the man is just, the man is just absolutely awesome. I, I really would, I want to get to know him better. Um I, you got me excited now <laughs> because I don't know what his schedule is like or anything else or what his policies were. But uh, I actually asked him, in fact, I should follow up on it. I asked him if he'd be willing to do a, an interview with me for you guys here. And uh, he said he'd love to, but he's pretty busy, but we could work out of time. I'm thinking, wow, that's like going to. I don't know, Rob Web Slomo Roosh and saying, would you mind coming on my little irrelevant little broadcast? You know, um, I was just incredibly honored that he he had agreed to even consider it. So I want to talk to him and do it. I want I want to introduce my folks here, you guys to him and do do something with him. I forget that had slipped my mind actually until just now. Anyway, now I'm just babbling. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you got me excited, Jesse. All right. We're going to go ahead and close it. Um, I want to thank you all. If you're interested in 
either helping to host one of these events, and we'll have to come up with a good name for them, uh, or attending what we're thinking about doing in Missouri, or anything like that. Or if you're interested in the Noahide Way, or if you're interested in this wonderful book, This Is My God by Herman Wook, then um, do join the Noahide group. The link is here. You'll see it. Um, join the Noahide group. Uh, when you go in there, Jesse, don't worry about it because we know you. We'll just approve you. But if we don't necessarily recognize your name, we need to have you fill out the answer the questions that are there. Questions are pretty simple questions. Are you a Noahide? Why do you want to join? And that kind of stuff. Um, we want to make sure that the Noahide group stays a place where Noahides feel free to express their feelings and their concerns and their questions. But to do fill out the questions if you apply. But we'd love to have you all. Um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and end it. Thank you all for watching. And until next time, my sincere prayer is that God would bless you and that he would cause his face to shine ever more upon you. And uh, Bezer Hashem, I will see you and Donald will see you on Wednesday right here at 12 noon. God bless. Thanks a lot. Shalom. And thank you, friends. Bezer Hashem. I'll see you Wednesday at noon. God bless.